<laughs> ready to um, ready to go again. Thank you for coming back. I see all familiar faces, so that's good. It's a good sign. Um, being in the U.S. quite a quite a bit, I couldn't resist to have a commercial break, but um, at the start of this this show, but uh, it's going to be a technical commercial break, and it will be very brief. The reason is that. Um, I'll be showing performance numbers on our Spark processors, and I guess a very few of you are familiar with what that is about. So, but again, I'll keep it very brief. Of course, in in the break or any time, I can always talk about more. So, we currently have what we call the T5 processor. The T5 processor has 16 cores. Each core is running at 3.6 gigahertz. Um, the core um, has each core has eight threads. So in uh, in total, one chip has 128 threads, and the chip is designed to have an eight-way directly connected system. So you have an eight-socket, 1,024 threaded system, or point-to-point -point connection. You can do bigger, and then you have a, a second layer of network. And um, this is um, this is a simple architecture, uh, a simple architecture diagram. It's not a simple architecture, but it's a pretty it's a CCNUMA system. For sure, because each uh, each T5 has um, has its own memory controller, but it's a fairly flat uh, CC NUMA system. The the ratio is about I think about 40 percent when you go off your socket, but it it still pays off to to optimize for it. I mean, why why waste that kind of performance? But um, the largest system that we have is called M632. It's called 30 because it, it has the, the 32 sockets and um, this is this is the architecture in total uh, that will give you 384 cores at 3.6 gigahertz and a little over 3,000 threads and um, it also supports 32 terabyte chip. Now what's on the way to you that we haven't we talked about it so this is this is public information but we um, we haven't announced systems yet. This is the, the, the Spark M7, that's the new processor. And um, we, we have a new core, um, a redesigned core compared to the T5. There are 32 now on the chip. The speed is faster. I can't give them the final uh, speed yet. Again, eight threads per core. That part is pretty much the same. In total, it gives you 256 threads um, per socket, and again, um, this system can go eight-way glueless. You can go bigger, as we did with the M6, but then you add an extra layer of network. This is a, I will skip this. This is the, the, the new core. It's a pretty modern core, actually. Uh, out of order, two-way superscalar, respectable speed, again, eight threads. What I want to, um, what I want to, Mention after after this, I'll show a little bit about the architecture, but again, um, 64 uh, megabytes L3 cache, eight controllers. So the strength of this chip is actually in the bandwidth. We've got an awful lot of bandwidth. The measured bandwidth is about 150 gigabytes second memory bandwidth. And um, we can go to much bigger systems. The question is, do you want to do that? How many people actually are willing to pay for it? It's a matter of you know, business side. Technically, it, it can go much further. What I find interesting is this is the first chip where we started having accelerators, but not, not like your common GPU. These are integrated and, and have specific purposes. And what we call DAX, the data analytics accelerators, are really primarily targeting um, the database to accelerate local databases. It doesn't come as a surprise. And um, I won't say anything more about that, but it's an interesting trend in what you do when you can put more things on the chip. Here's a little bit more detail on how it how it works. So you have what we call these core clusters, and they're connected, internally connected within the chip. Um, what the last thing I want to show is what I think is really interesting has nothing to do with performance, but correctness. And um, it is under, <laughs> the name has been changed internally. Uh, we settled for application data integrity or ADI, which is kind of a little bit of a funny name, but basically what you do in your memory, you have your data and you have your addresses. And in addition to that, 
data now has a specific color. That's the way to see it. And you can just summarize this in just a few words, but uh, it is, I think, pretty nice. If you try to access data that does not have your color, a trap will be generated. And that prevents, at hardware speed, things like memory buffer overflow, overrun problems. Uh, if you try to malloc outside of or start to access outside of what you've malloc. So all these nasty memory problems that have been available in tools before are now detected at hardware speed. So we have we have our own tool to do this checking. It's called Discover, and and that takes advantage of that. So the huge performance penalty that you usually have with these kind of checks is pretty much gone with this. And I think that's interesting to add a correctness feature instead of always you know, going for performance. So very simple idea, you, you try to load from something that's not your color, and a signal is generated. Okay. That was the commercial. I hope it was not too painful. I tried to keep it short. So I'm now going to talk about um, open and and performance, open and All right. So I'll talk about a myth, and I guess you, you can guess what it is. Then I'll, um, I'll I'll talk about some of the darker corners of the OpenMP building. Um, then I'll show some um, cases and there's a there's a wrap. The myth. So, what's a myth? It's something widely believed but false. And I guess you can you can imagine what that is. Let's see, my animation works. And the myth is. OpenMP does not scale. And you'll find that in too many places. People saying it, and once you start asking, it turns out to be different. So what I'm going to talk about, what I'm going to show you now is, you know, it's got to be a little lightweight after, after lunch, is I'll show you an imaginary discussion with an imaginary person who comes to me and says, OpenMP does not scale. And I will show you my side of the discussion only, but I think it will be clear what the answers are from the others. So, when you say OpenMP doesn't care, what, what does that really, really mean? Think about it, a, a programming model cannot not scale. Many things cannot scale. To start with, the implementation could be very poor. I mean, if it takes three days to, to create 100 threads, then it doesn't scale. Um, so it could be the implementation that doesn't scale. It could be that you're running on kind of the wrong type of hardware for your application requirements. Like your application has certain needs and you pick an architecture that's not really suitable for that. That happens too. Or it could be kind of you. Um, you wrote something and, and not knowing what's going on and that turns out to be the bottom. And that's what I'll be talking about. How, how you can prevent some pitfalls in the, in the software. Some questions I could ask. So my first question would be, so you wrote a parallel program, you used OpenMP, and it doesn't perform. I think that's that's what you're really saying when OpenMP doesn't scale. And okay, I see. So did you make sure the program was fairly well optimized in, in sequential mode? Because if it doesn't run well on one core, what do you think will happen on 100, 200, 1,000? It won't get any better, it actually get worse very, very quickly. So, you didn't. Why do you expect the program to scale then? You just think it should, and you used all the cores. Did you maybe do some speed up estimate using Amdahl's law? No, that's not a new EU financial bailout program, <laughs> that's something else. I know you can't know everything, but did you at least use a tool to find out where you're spending most of your time? Profiler. You didn't. You just parallelized all the loops in the program. Okay. Well, having done that, did you avoid trying to avoid? Did you avoid trying to parallelize the inner loop, innermost loop in the loop net? You didn't. Did you minimize the number of parallel regions then? 
You didn't. It just worked fine the way it was. Did you look at the no weight clause to minimize the use of the barrier? We never heard of a barrier. Maybe you maybe should read a little bit. Um, do all threads roughly perform the same amount of work? You don't know, you think it's okay. Okay, well, I hope you're right. Did you maximize the use of private data or you just shared all of it? Ah, yeah, sharing is easier. Okay, I see. Uh, looks like you're using a CC NUMA system that you take that into account. Never heard of that either. That's somewhat <laughs> unfortunate. Could, could perhaps be false sharing affecting your performance. Never heard of that either. Maybe maybe you should learn a little more about those things. So what did you do next to address, you know, you, clearly you have a performance problem. So what did you do next to address that? You switched to MPI. Okay. Does that perform any better then? You don't know. You're still debugging the code. <laughs> Well, while you're waiting for that debug run to finish, let's look at that OpenMP in performance in more detail. There we go. Definitely, the, the ease of use of OpenMP is a mixed lesson. I think for those of you who are new to OpenMP or have some experience, you'll find that it's not so hard to get going. The problem is it may be terrible for performance. While in other models, you go through a possibly deep learning curve but then you get the reward. With OpenMP, it's more subtle. You have different ways to parallelize something. And it turns out that only one of them is the efficient one, but how can you tell? So that's what I'm going to talk about. The things to do and the things not to do. So the ease of use is a mixed blessing. I still like it, but there's some things that you need to be aware of. And, and I think not much written down about that either when you start searching for it. It's not like, a, like MPI is very well understood and documented. And, and like nobody in their right mind will send one zillion one byte messages to one note. You, you just don't do that. Okay. Same things, equivalent things are true for OpenMP, although the rules are different and people do that because they don't know. So let's look at it. And two of the nasty things that are kind of silently happening are CC NUMA and false sharing. The funny thing is, and they're real, I mean, that happens, and I'll show you examples, but it has nothing to do with OpenMP. It's the way shared memory systems are, are designed, and in particular things like cache coherence, which is really nice, but it, it can hurt you if you don't use it in the right way. So again, nothing to do with OpenMP. One, one time I, I hope to have some time to show you exactly the same nasty things in a POSIX LEDs application as in OpenMP, but you, you happen to use OpenMP and um, that's, very, that's very natural thing. Okay, that was OpenMP, but very often it's something else. And one of them is false sharing, although I, I, there's many people dialing in, but who, who in this room is familiar with false sharing? Okay. Well, not so many. That's, uh, that's what I was afraid of because it's um, a it's pretty evil, evil thing to happen. And I'll, I won't go into much of the detail of the underlying uh, things that are happening, but here's a, a one slide that tries to explain it. You have this cache line, and whenever you need data, that data will come, unless it's extremely large, but will come as, a, as part of a line. A cache line is the size of the cache line is designed by, arch by architects, could be 32 bytes, 64 bytes, maybe 128. There are very good reasons to have very long cache lines, and there are equally but different good reasons to have short cache lines. So there's no one size fits all. That's why different systems have different design choices made. But it's it's a chunk of data more than you typically need. So if you need like a one double position element, you get a cache line with multiple of these elements. And somebody else who may need a different element that happens to be in the same line will get a copy. So it's very natural to have multiple copies floating around of their cache line. So far, that's good. As long as you read, it's good. But what if you modify an element? What if this core decides to modify the yellow element? Now I have an inconsistency. So this is, this is, this is now stale data. And, and that's getting access to the right data is handled by cache coherence. That's the underlying system. So what will happen 
this gray part, which are the state bits of that line, that are like clean or dirty or whatever, they you have different states in the cash coherence protocol, they'll change so that anybody who attempts to get the cash line will say, wait a minute, I have an old copy. I need to get a new one somewhere. And that includes this one. Although we know that the blue element wasn't modified, it can't tell. It will see a dirty cash line and say, okay, I gotta get a new one. Now that happens all the time. That's fine, unless it's in the heart of your algorithm. If you hit this all the time in the middle of your innermost loop, then and the degradation is really bad. It, it's really bad. I used to have some slides to show how bad it was, but that was too depressing. I took them out. So it, it is really bad, so it, it is something to take into account. And um, it's called false sharing. And the reason, the reason for that to exist is that these state bits they keep track of the, the status on the on the cache line basis, not on a byte basis. And that's cost. I mean, these caches are very large. If you would have to keep track of every single byte, that would add a lot of infrastructure to the design, and that's expensive. So a long time ago, somebody decided we'll do that on the cache line, cache line level. So that's in a nutshell is what false sharing, sharing is. So what are the red flags? We need to have three conditions. First of all, it happens when you modify data. Technically, it happens on the store instruction. So as long as you read, it doesn't matter. You read as much data as you want, no false sharing. As soon as you modify an element, that line gets invalidated. So the bad things happen when you have multiple threads, and they hit the same cache line over and over again. That line will travel throughout the system because but each time a threat will need it, say, so wait a minute, I have an old copy, I need to get a new one. And that's, that's fairly expensive. So when that happens very often, and at the same time, then false sharing is going to happen, and that's bad for your scalability. Hence the recommendation, use local data where you can, because you immediately violate rule number one, it's not shared anymore, and they're all, and, and they're all fine. The way you do that in practice is that often what you can do is you can do some local updates. And only when you're done, if it has to be shared, you copy it back to some shared data structure. So often you have some scalar, and let's say you're accumulating something, you accumulate in that local scalar, and eventually you write it back into the array. That will give you false sharing, but it's like an order of magnitude more or less. So that's the general idea um, how to avoid false sharing. There's other ways, but something to keep up with. And again, read only if not. So that's one of the dark, very dark dungeons of the building. Mm. The other one is this. I mean, it's nice to get all the scalable bandwidth, but as I talked about in the morning session, um, with CCNUMA comes some sort of responsibility to make sure you get you run close to your data. And the burden is on you. That's, that's one, of the, one of the painful things. I've shown this slide um, before the break this morning, but I, I put it back in again because I'm not sure everybody dialed in for that session, so all of you bear with me. Um, this thing is again uh, already. You got two CPUs, could be multi-core, whatever, um, one socket, and each socket has its own memory controller, talks to its own memory, but Thanks to a cache coherent interconnect, everybody else will know what's going on. You know exactly what's going on. When you need a variable, you'll get it. You don't have to do anything for that. The only thing is the time to get it could be vastly different. This is only a two-socket system, but this is local memory access. That's the best you can do. It wouldn't be so good if this was remote access. And as I said uh, this morning, um, this is hard to avoid 100% but you don't want to have this kind of remote access happening 90%. So it's always a bit of a trade-off to decide where your data go. And again, I'll, I'll show you a little bit of that as part of the performance case study. So this is definitely important on CCNUMA systems, and since even two-socket systems are CCNUMA these days, it pretty much affects everybody. Yeah. So the cost is not only longer memory access time, if they all hit onto the same memory controller, you can, you can saturate that memory controller and, and, and get an extra performance loss. 
Luckily, OpenMP 4.0 provides support for TCNUMA. That was the last part this morning. Um, I extensively talked about the OMP places and OMP prop binds. What I'll, I'll show you later is, in general, how you can handle uh, optimized for CCNUMA. And I think of pretty much all the OSs use this first touch principle to replace the data. So what is first touch? Again, I've seen this before. You've got two sockets, each with their own memory, and here's a little loop. And I'm just initializing a vector to zero. And if I don't do anything, one core, one thread will execute that. And for the rest of the lifetime of that data, this core will own the data. So that's the ownership. And uh, as I mentioned this morning as well, this allocation of data is done at the page level. So um, and a typical page size default is four kilobytes, maybe eight kilobytes. But fairly large chunk of data relative to just a few data elements that you access. The solution is, is pretty straightforward. You parallelize this loop, and for demonstration purposes, I, I do that on two threads here. And what will happen, both will initialize half of that vector, and each will get half of that vector into their memory. And hopefully, that's the way you'll, that's going to be close to the thread meaning, which isn't always the case. I mean, this is, I, I'm, I'm talking about the ideal world here. And again, I'll, I'll show a little bit more of the, the gory real world that can sometimes happen, but this is the goal. So that's what you want to do. And in that way, you exploit the first touch. And as, I, um, and as OpenMP has the affinity support, you can map the, the threads onto where you think the data is going to be. So those are two things, all sharing TC Numa. And I'll, I'm now going to go through some case studies. The problem with case studies is they're always kind of specific. So I try to pick something that's general enough to have some more general message than only applicable to a very small subset of, of users, but they are, by definition, specific. So that's the title of the first case study. And it shows my favorite little algorithm because it's so simple and actually has so many interesting things in it. It's multiplying a matrix with a vector straight from the textbook. What you do here in C, you take the dot product of the rows of the matrix, multiply that with a vector, and that gives you a result. That's pretty much embarrassingly parallel because all these dot products are independent. And actually, any self-respecting automatically parallelizing compiler will do this for you. But if you would do that yourself with OpenMP, you know you want to do, you want to parallelize this outer loop. I look. That's the loop over the rows of this over this matrix. So uh, using OpenMP, that's extremely straightforward. Uh, note that I use the shortcut, the parallel four, and this works. This will get me the parallelism. So I ran it, and um, at that time I only had access to an older the Halem system, but as you'll see shortly, that really actually turns out to not matter. What I'm showing you here is the performance in megaflops or gigaflops as a function of the size of the matrix. And I do that for multiple, multiple threads. And I use the notation, the number of cores times the number of threads. So this was one core, one thread, two cores, one thread per core, and so forth. All the way up to the 16 threads in this, in this box. There's a couple of things to note. First of all, if the matrix is very small, up to, in this case, up to around 64 kilobytes, the parallel version is slow. No surprise, that's a very, very small matrix. There's not enough work to amortize the cost of what I'm doing. And this is where this if clause comes in handy. You could say, if the matrix is whatever, then don't go parallel. So your performance, these, these lines here would be all be roughly the same you wouldn't get any improvement, but you wouldn't get a slowdown either. So that's how you can use the clause. Then in a certain range of the memory hierarchy, we actually get very good performance here 
you even get super linear scaling. This one right here is more than twice as fast. And that's because that's quite common on shared memory systems. You get additional cache space available as you add threads. You add cores, cores have cache space. So all of a sudden, the data that didn't fit in the cache is now can fit because you have more cache space. Quite natural, nice, that happens. Um, but not always like that, as this shows, once you go to larger matrices, it's game over. No matter how many threads I throw at it, uh, the best speed up is only with two threads in about 1.6. Remember, this was an embarrassingly parallel algorithm. That's not very impressive. So, what's going on? So, I need to get a little bit technical. <laughs> And again, you've seen this, this picture over and over again, and there we are again. But this is the, in this case, the specifics of that chip. Um, that chip had um, eight cores. Each core has two hardware threads. But the way I draw it is very similar to what I showed earlier. This is a CC Numa box. I hope that's clear. As small as it is, it is a CC Numa box. The interconnect, the quick pad interconnect, is a cache coherent interconnect. But each, each socket has a portion of the memory. So we're talking about a CC Numa system. So what do we do? Well, what you need to do is you need to figure out where the data is. The algorithm itself parallelizes, but where was the data that I need? Well, I was very sloppy with the data initialization. That was sequential. So one socket didn't have any of the data, and the other one had all of it. So what do you do? Think about the first touch. You've got to go back to the drawing board. You've got to go back to how you initialize the data. And this is my data, new data initialization card. I'm really sorry about this, but I can't take any requests right now. Please try again in a little while. <laughs> okay. Well, apologies accepted. <laughs> so, straight forward, um, again, from, you know, more or less from the textbook, what I need to do, and again, this is why I said you go back to the drawing board. What does this algorithm do? It takes the dot product of the row of the matrix times the vector. So, and if I run this on two threads, say, one thread will access the, the top half of the array and the other one, the bottom half, if I use the static schedule in which I'm actually doing this. So what I need to make sure is this part is in the memory of the thread that executes this part of the update and the other one and the other one. There's a little catch here. This vector is shared by all. All of them have to read. So there's no optimal placement for that. Either I could copy it to all the memories, but that's pretty expensive. You really, you really should try to avoid copying data. That's the cost of that gets out of hand very quickly. I'd rather rely on some caching when you read in that vector that hopefully some of my data or all of it is still in a higher level cache. That's usually a better thing. Be, be very careful with copying, but that could be a solution. Here I, I went the easy way. Now, so what I do, I first of all, I take that vector that was C, and I do parallelize the initialization. So at least half of it is in the right place on two thirds. I mean, in quarter is on the, in the right place on four thirds. It's suboptimal, but it's about the best I can do it. The key part is in the matrix. So. I am going to initialize the matrix, and I'm going to initialize it in parallel over the rows, exactly as my algorithm access. I was lucky that that was the case. I mean, like I said, this is, this is the best case you can get, where the way you initialize the data and the way it's used is pretty much the same. The one thing in red here is, that kind of got a little bit carried away, but the same observations are true for the output vector. Before you can write, your result, the cache line has to be in your cache before you can write into it. So the same locality rules hold for the destination, not only the input. So it's a, probably you can't even measure the difference, but I couldn't resist to do this one as well, just for demonstration purposes. And then I got better scalability. It's about 2x faster. Still not very high, but hey, it's a 2x improvement that I get by, by, uh, by reworking my data initialization. It wasn't my algorithm again, it was the data placement. To show you, this is generic. 
I took a Spark system. That's an older T4 system, but it's kind of a smaller scale version of the T5. Um, you got a bunch of cores, you got your threads, and I really tried to draw it to make it look as similar as the other one. Same kind of memory hierarchy idea. You have your local memory, and you have some interconnect that glues it all together. So I took the same code, and um, initially, again, um, I didn't get any speed up beyond two threads. And I, I used my initialization trick, and again, I got a roughly get a factor of two performance improvement. And when you put that in one chart, you see that although in absolute sense the performance is different, that doesn't matter. The improvement is roughly about 2x. And this is a small scale thing. You know, these things start to hurt more and more as you go to larger shared memory systems with, uh, with more and more cores. The next one. Uh, Fortran example. A three dimensional array update. I'm updating an array X, and as it turns out, first I get rule number one always make sure the program runs reasonably well in single thread. No point in, in trying to parallelize a program that runs like a dog. And the reason for that, I didn't say that yet, is running like a dog usually means you abuse the memory system. You go to the memory system way too often. And when you do that in parallel, you're overloading the interconnect. And no matter how fast these interconnects are, none of them can saturate a load like that. Where all threads go over the interconnect and get data from somewhere else. So, so first make sure that the, the program performs reasonably well single thread. Or play with some compiler options or whatever you like. Like, okay, this isn't too bad. And then parallelize. So this one is okay. This is written in the right way for Fortran to access this three-dimensional array. The loops are ordered in the right way. So that's fine. But unfortunately, there are two dependents. Triple IJK depends on IJK minus one. So that's a dependence in the, in the third dimension. And here's the dependence in the second dimension. So it can't just simply parallelize that. I may be able to have some wave from a solver, but as written, I cannot have a parallel do on the K or the J. So if you do it like this, what, what is the problem? Well, the problem is, is that there's this implied barrier here that will cost you the performance as you add threads, certainly going to affect you. So that's because of this dependence. I, I'm stuck with only one dimension. So I ran it. And indeed, it performs like a dog. It, um, at eight threads, it's a game over. The performance drops very, very quickly. And I was not surprised. <clears throat> sure, yeah, this was, I know this is not the good way to do it, but you know, always do the sanity check. And indeed, it didn't perform well. I then used our profiler called the, the uh, performance analyzer, as we call it, to compare the single thread run and the two thread run. As I said this morning, whenever I look at performance problems, I, I start with comparing one and two threads, because only if I understand that, I can try to go bigger. So here I'm comparing side by side the, the one thread, the two thread, and I look at the user CPU time, the work time in, in OpenMP, and the wait time in OpenMP. That's, that's one of the, the things our, our profiler spits out. It tells you how much time you spend doing some, some sort of hopefully useful work and overhead like waiting. And it's a little small, but what you see here is when you look at this function it's called block 3D, from 2.7 seconds it goes to 2. Not very impressive, but it is a little bit faster. The thing that literally sticks out is the wait time that's almost nothing goes to over two seconds, already on two seconds. That's like very, very strange, because why would there be so much wait time? Well, I had a regular vector operation that I cut in pieces. I didn't understand the wait time. And I look at the source level, and it confirms where it is, and it, indeed, it, it shows that that loop having a wait time from 18 milliseconds to 2.3 seconds, that's a huge jump. I really couldn't figure it out. I had no idea what was going on. I switched 
Our tool has, um, and I need to explain that because I'll be showing more of it, what we call the timeline. The timeline is shown for each thread, and you can load multiple experiments, as I'm doing here. This was an experiment on two threads, and this one was, I think, on eight. And what it shows is time from left to right, and each color represents a state in the OS here. And when you look, so anything but green is bad news. Like blue means system time. System time here means that was initializing the pages for the for the data. So that wasn't all that all that interesting. At the application level, each function has a different color. And we do that for every snapshot that we make. And what I do here, I highlight the bad ones. And let me add the, the legend. The bad ones here are red, that's the barrier, and the blue, which is the idle time of the thread. So what you're seeing here, this was on the master thread. This is on the second thread. What I see is I see the barrier cost. That's what I expected. But I also see that idle time here, the blue one. And that's not what I expected. So it, it confirms, confirms what I already saw. And um, when I zoom in, I see that the master thread, that this is a single thread, that's kind of boring, but the master thread here in two, the master thread is very active, occasionally you have, have a spike, but that is idle time. And when I go to more threads, it gets worse and worse. And this is a little bit more of the same. When I go to 16 threads, I see that uh, really getting out of hand. So for too long, I couldn't figure out where does the idle time come from? How can it be on a vector operation? And then I realized this is full shim. Because when I, I have one thread, there's nothing to share. But when I have two threads, well, what if this is the excess part of the first thread, this is of the second thread, and, and the span a cache line? I have one cache line contention, only one. But then I go to four, I got three, and so forth. And especially when you have short pieces of data, that's very, very likely to happen because like, the impact of that is very large relative to the other things you're doing. So how do you find out? Actually, as far as I know, detecting false sharing is still black art with a big crystal ball and wishful thinking. But luckily, we have counters now that can help you point at it. And counters are processor specific. For each processor that you use, you need to figure out what the name is, which can be very cryptic, unclear. I mean, it's not an easy thing in general, but the information is there. So on our chip, I looked at the counter that shows me how many cache line invalidations I have. Remember that picture where you valid, invalidate the line? Well, this is exponential growth as I, as I increase the number of threads. So that's really the, the smoking, smoking gun. I mean, it was over 200 times higher or just 32 threads. Yeah. So this is definitely cost sharing at work, unfortunately. Okay. There's several ways you can tackle cost sharing. Um, in this case, I found something that's more or less generic because you have the you have the dependence in the two dimensions here. But I don't have luckily don't have a dependence in the I direction. That means I can do planes. In parallel, the other end, this plane is independent. Yeah. Well, but if I can do a plane in parallel, I can do a three dimensional subplot. That's shown here. Just don't look at the code yet and the text. Basically, what you do is you, you have each thread work on its own three dimensional subplot. And um, then you run into what I call the plus or minus one problem. You need to figure out what's the start and end value of each thread. And I usually get it right almost the first time. But the plus or minus one missing. It's not hard, it's just bookkeeping. And this is what I came up with for the code. Um, now, I actually, I, I, I killed two birds with one stone because I have one big parallel region. There's no barrier anymore other than one at the end. Each thread will ask, first ask for its thread ID. And then I figure out the start and end value, the, the size, the, the position in the block that you work on. I mean, it's not hard, and you just got to be careful and make sure you get the indexing right, but nothing difficult about it. 
So all I need to do is adapt this thing to accept the start and end value, and they'll all call this function in parallel. And, and it shows. I got way better performance. I got these little you know, jigsaw kind of like, that's, that's loading balance. So that, just ignore that. That's because it doesn't always equally divide the number of threads, so you get some loading balance. But overall, um, I get about 4x uh, performance improvement with a, with a very simple change. And always do the sanity check. Now this timeline looks very well behaved. Like here, this was, I don't know, four, four threads, I guess. Mm -hmm. Only one barrier. No, not all that idle time in between. So, and uh, 16, it's more of the same. It just confirms that this was uh, one little thing that I never looked into. That it's still a little bit of loading balance when you zoom in, but it's so small. I didn't really care anymore. And when I re measure those cache line invalidations, that's the blue one now versus the red one, is pretty much, much gone. So it again, it confirms that. There's still a little bit of invalidations, but that's hard to avoid, and that's fine. So that was one thing I did. But there's another thing you can do. Yeah. Is that um, this is a funny use of opening key. And um, once you've seen it a few times, you start to get used to it. But I, I want to carefully explain it. The problem was that I had this this whole parallel region embedded here. And remember the parallel region is expensive. So that cost is, is about n squared times. That's really high. So what I want to do is I want to have one parallel region and inside my do or four, my parallel do or parallel four. What does that mean? That means that all threads will execute this whole do They'll all execute this do, and then they'll split the work. So this is on two threads how this would execute. They all start with k equals two, the first loop iteration, then j equals two. Then they hit that inner loop. And this was a work sharing do, so they'll split that work. They'll increment j, and in that way, it, it works. So now, by now, I have actually have four different versions. I had the bad one. Of course, I tried the compiler. This is this is relatively easy for a compiler to analyze. I have my blocks version with a single parallel region, and the last one, which is just a different implementation. And um, all of them do significantly better than the original version. Um, what was kind of pleasant surprise is that the, the parallelizing compiler did very well. It turns out it generates the same code as I did by hand. Quite, I was quite impressed. I mean, well, <laughs> more than I expected. So the, um, the OMP do that kind of funny version wins first, but eventually it loses out. And since I'm only interested in high thread counts, I never looked into what was going on here. So. That's, that was what I thought was the end of this story, but some things never end. So I don't know why, but I started playing with software prefetch, which we have on our compiler. The hardware does automatic prefetch. And um, there's an addition you can ask the compiler to insert software prefetch instructions. And um, what I saw was that without the software prefetch, initially it's slower because in many cases, software prefetch is a good idea. And then it started to win. I had, again, no idea what was going on here. What was that? Well, this is when these hardware counters can be incredibly useful. I got some suspicion. Because when I did that first work, I didn't really, I didn't look at CCNUMA at all. So how about data locality? And this is another counter. It misses, it measures how often I had a local data cache miss, but, I found, but the data was somewhere remote. We also have a counter to tell you I missed it, but it was somewhere else in the memory here locally. That's kind of not, that's a nice one to have, but this is the bad one. This is the one you don't want to see too high. And what you see, well, up to 
eight threads very low because this processor has eight cores. So then I go beyond that, and that's when I start seeing my remote, my remote misses. And um, what I see, and that surprised me, is my so nicely optimized version is, is worse in terms of CC Numa. So I gained on one side, and then I lost on another side. I mean, that's real life. This is why these are thirty. So yeah, what's going on here? And now we need to get really technical. Um, many of these things are with memory related. So let's look at how that array X, that three-dimensional array, is stored in memory. It's a three-dimensional array. As all Fortran people all know, or should know, Fortran arrays are stored by the columns first. So you've got the first column in memory, then the next one, the next one. So this is like all imaginary sizes. Of course, this is the first column. This is the second column and so forth. The problem is, how about how it relates that to the page size? What if I have some very unfortunate combination of things that I have a page size that spends more than one column? That can happen. So it's one column plus a little bit, or less, doesn't matter. So it's not nicely aligned and cut off at the right size. So that's how things are laid out in memory. And there I, there I am with my threads. And what you see, this is a page, this is one unit. So like this one is heavily contended by all thread zero and thread one. But the page can only be in one place at any point in time. So I have access conflict in terms of performance on, at the page now. And some, the blocking thing, actually, when you look deeper at that, which I won't do here, but when you look deeper at the blocking, you realize that doesn't cut it. That doesn't, that doesn't help you. I came up with a hack, nothing else than a hack, just as a proof of concept to see, well, okay, what, what can I do here? What I did is I made the array four-dimensional, and I'm accessing it over the over the thread ID. I want to stress that I don't need more memory. I just organize it in a different way. Whether you can do that in the full real application is, of course, a question. But if you can do that, this is what you might be able to do. Again, I don't need more memory. I'll show you the code in a, in a, min in a minute. I need a little bit more. I shouldn't say no. That's a very, very, very little uh, addition additional memory requirements. And now what I do in my parallel region, I get the thread idea and it will again figure out what I need to do and then access according to the, to the thread idea. So that's more complicated. I mean, and here with first touch, I first make sure that each thread will get the data locally. So this is the initialization that's new, something I didn't do before. And then the, the real algorithm is almost the same. I need to get that thread idea, which I need it anyhow, and it, it's another index into the array. And when you look at the counters, you see that this, and I'll show you the performance on the next slide, you see that this has to work because originally, when I counted the remote accesses that a thread had, you see, these are these are modest because it owns the data, and these are high because these threads don't own the data. With the blue one, I distributed the data, and they're pretty much all equal. So this is, like I said, this is CC new might work, and in total, it's significant. Again, that hack to go to 4D, I'm not entirely proud of that, but it's worth to show this is the way you could do it. And, and it definitely works, whether it's applicable in the real code, I'm not sure, but so. So, again, many would bail out the blue line and say, it's going to be a good scale. Okay. Um, the, next, um, the next case is.